So it's Friday already, so it's the fourth day of this wonderful conference. And we've already had the chance to discuss this topic um, in, on several occasions, different workshops that have been going on already. And we would uh, like to actually make use of that, that we had these discussions already in the past days, um, and reflect on some of the, the topics that we've heard, and also make use of this uh, unique opportunity to have that many experts um, in from around the globe in one room. So we would like to see this really as a joint learning exercise where we can engage, of course, with our panelists, but also with you um, in the audience. And uh, usually this is the point where I would say that we have a panel and afterwards we will have sufficient time for Q&A, but actually we would like to be a bit more radical about engagement and we will ask you to join uh, buzz groups or reflection groups um, after the first round of panel questions. Um, exactly, so um, we will have to see when more people come in whether we can um, go forward with that approach, but that's what we would like to do. But before we start with our discussion, we would also like to, to hear and learn who's in the room here with us. So I would like to raise a couple of questions and ask you to just answer the question by raising your hands so we can see who's here. I would like to start by asking you, who feels like they're living in a kleptocratic system? If you would, I wait for the participants. Okay, by the rise of hands, who feels like they're living in a kleptocratic system at the moment? <laughs> I see a lot of more or less. I think it would have been interesting also to, to ask that question before the conference because uh, this conference for me has already changed. I think before I would have said no, but right now I kind of feel like we all live in a somehow global <laughs> kleptocratic system. So yeah, I understand the so-so answer. Um, so, second question, who of you feels like something can be done about fighting these kleptocratic systems? Ah, there's a lot of optimism, that's good, that's brilliant, I like that. Um, and who of you feels like the right things are already being done about it? Ah, not that much optimism anymore in the room, but more skepticism. We hope that we can maybe also get some answers to why we feel like the right things are not being done about it uh, right now. And last question, who of you is um, actually actively engaged in fighting kleptocratic systems in the workplace? Wow, so we do have a lot of experts in the room, that's great. And that's exactly the expertise that we would like to tap on in our buzz groups um, later on. So thank you very much for that feedback. Um, okay, so let me open this session by uh, telling you a little bit about the background and the rationale why we handed in the proposal for this workshop. And by we, I mean my colleague Carola Frank over here and myself, Anna Sturmfels. We're both working at GIZ, which is an implementing agency of German Development Corporation. And Carola and myself, we um, work as planning experts. So as the title suggests, it's our responsibility to plan projects uh, or to support the planning processes of um, projects on a certain topic. In my case, I support the planning processes of anti-corruption programs. And in Carola's case, she supports the planning processes of um, programs working in the field of fighting illicit financial flows. So to just give you an idea of what that means, I've been doing this for the past five years and I've supported the planning and the designing of programs on anti-corruption in around 20 countries around the globe in the past five years. So as implementers, we do see the growing relevance of the topic of fighting kleptocra um, kleptocratic systems and, and networks. And we do feel like this is also, as I said, reflected here at the conference, but also reflected by an increased interest of don donor organizations who want to focus on really targeting these kleptocratic um, structures with their, with their programs. And as implementers, we do see, and we're gonna hear from our panelists, that a lot is already being done about, yeah, on the topic or um, about fighting kleptocratic systems. But as planners that Caro and I are, we are still asking ourselves some questions. 
So we're asking ourselves, okay, we have all of that brilliant expertise, we have, we have all of that experience, we have strategies, we have ideas, but how do we actually really put this into practice? What do we have to consider when we plan our projects uh, in those topics? Which are actually the most effective measures to fight kleptocratic systems where and when? looking ahead, not looking back, learning from the experience, but really trying to identify what's going to be the most effective way to support partners, uh, partner countries in their fight, you know, in the coming three years, in the coming five years. So, and we hope that we can get some answers to these questions actually today from our panelists and, and from our audience. Um, so we would like to take you on a little journey, do a little experiment with all of you. So. Let's jointly imagine that the increased attention that the topic gets will actually also divert into increased funding, which we know is not always the case. But let's imagine that donor organizations are earmarking additional and new funds to the topic of fighting kleptocratic networks. And, and let's imagine that we all have been asked by an international donor organization to hand in a project proposal um, targeted at fighting kleptocratic systems. Um, in a global program. So in a global program for us means we are asked to implement activities on partner country level, regional level, as well as international level. And we would like to develop that project proposal here today jointly with our panel and with you in the audience. And we would like to do so by having a first round of uh, questions to our panelists who are going to remind us about the wide scope that exists and the, the broad experience that we have um, in fighting kleptocratic systems. And then in the buzz groups and the reflection groups that we want to do um, afterwards, we're going to focus on some of the core questions or core elements um, for our future program on fighting kleptocratic structures. Okay, so with all of this said, um, let me also introduce our panel, our panelists. Um, I am going to start, this is no uh, specific order, I'm just going to start because uh, Johannes is sitting next to me with Johannes Ferguson. Johannes Ferguson is the head of the Competence Center on um, Public Administration and Finance, so he's actually the boss of Caro and myself. And previously he has been working as the head of different GIZ programs in the field of anti-corruption and integrity. And next to him we have Susanna Wink, Susanna has been um, in the steering committee of the Open Government Partnership for the past six years. And in her home country, Slovakia, she has been working for a watchdog organization. But more recently, two years ago, she started a new NGO, which is called The Currents. And next to her, we have Patrick Alley, who I'm probably not to introduce much, but <laughs> I will do so anyway. He's one of the three co-founders of Global Witness. And he has been engaged in um, around about 50 field investigations on kleptocratic system during that period. And this year, um, he has published a book called Very Bad People that actually, um, yeah, charts some of those key investigations. Global witness. Next to him, we have Karam, Karam Singh. Um, he has worked uh, in leading positions in the past 10 years for key public um, institutions, but currently, he is uh, also the executive director of Corruption Watch, which is the national chapter of Transparency International in South Africa. And then we have Veronica, uh, Ver Veronica Dragalin, who has actually started her professional career in the US, uh, amongst us others as um, prosecutor on corruption cases for um, the, uh, in Los Angeles. And in August, she has started her new mandate as the chief prosecutor of the Anti-Corruption Prosecution Office in Moldova. So a warm welcome to all of our panelists. Thank you very much for joining us and being here with us today. And I will start with the first question to Johannes. So how does GIZ actually support partner countries in fighting kleptocratic structures? Thank you, Anna. And, uh Good morning, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, first of all, um, 
start with a, a small point. I think it's important uh, that you say um, kleptocratic uh, structures versus kleptocracies because uh, it may be just a small difference, but it, uh, I think kleptocratic structures um, allows us to um, look, at the, um, uh, look at the issue a bit more broader, um, especially as implementers coming into a country, you know, not saying, um, well, we're here in a kleptocracy now to, uh, to support. Um, so kleptocratic uh, structures enables an approach on, on all levels, huh? um, taking also the global north and the global south into consideration and basically an approach which, uh, which goes across borders because uh, it's not um, a, a challenge of a single country. Um, second point of the three points uh, to, to answer your question is um, I think it's really important to understand how, um, how GIZ works. Um, because we are, um, we're a big organization, we have um, over 25,000 employees, and um, we are um, on the ground in 130 countries. Um, and I'm saying this because um, I think that's important to understand. Um, we are often already there, and we've been there for a long time. So um, when things change, when, when entry points occur, um, we, have, um, we have been there, we are there. Um, we often know whom to work with, um, who are the champions, um, and um, it allows us um, uh, to um, adapt um, our programs and also to co-create together with our partners. Um, this can go into directions that um, if chances occur, we work, let's say, just, just to be very broad, more with civil society or less with civil society, more with this partner or less with this partner. Um, but we're there, and it's also important we are implementers. Huh? We, we implement. Of course, we'll, we'll look at the political economy, but, um, but we're an implementing agency. We implement. And this brings me to my last point, and I think uh, probably the most important. We're technical. Um, we, um, we do technical support, and um, this means we develop uh, technical approaches. And um, a couple of years ago, um, we developed an approach uh, to fight uh, kleptocratic structures. Um, it's um, the um, an holistic follow the money approach, and um, I just want to um, just share it a little bit with you. Um, it basically encompasses um, three main elements: um, prevention, financial investigation, asset recovery. Um, not rocket science. It's pretty straightforward. Basically, the idea is, of course, to prevent. If you don't prevent, you investigate, and um, uh, when you investigate, you financially investigate the money. You you bring it back. Um, so we've been doing a lot of work around, let's say, this, uh, this circle. Um, in the field of, um, uh, in the field of um, investigation, um, uh, we've, um, uh, we've done a lot supporting public procurement offices. Um, we've set up um, beneficial um, ownership um, um, registries open to the public <laughs> in five countries. And um, we've, um, we've supported um, FSRBs, um, the PATAF style regional bodies. So there I'm already trying to, to point out it's not only national, but we're also working on a, on a regional level. Um, the FATF style regional bodies, in our view, are very um, important, um, let's say, networks, institutions. Um, first of all, in um, uh, ensuring um, FATF compliance, but on the other hand, also in um, voicing um, uh, um, uh, opinions of the Global South and feeding it into, um, uh, into the FATF process. Um, what do we do in the area of financial investigation? Um, I think here again we've, um, I mean obviously we, we're looking into the issues of supporting FIUs, um, but a very important point here is again basically um, linking um, uh, the predicate offense to the, um, uh, to the money, and so basically um, supporting um, uh, uh, multi-agency teams um, uh, in, um, uh, in not only investigating the pres uh, predicate offense, but also, um, also getting the money. And this, um, I think, pro probably for a lot of us here is, um, is, is, is common knowledge, but um, it's not practiced um, uh, s still in, um, in, 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 in many of our contexts. Um, We've we've got um, also very um, very um, good examples there. So um, so 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 do come and ask if you if you want more. Um, great um, um, great job together with um, uh, with the, with our Kenyan partners on um, multi agency approach by um, over factor ten um, the money um, came um, came back and could be um, retrieved per year. And um, last but not least, asset recovery. Um, here again, um, I, I um, just to highlight also the. Um, uh, 
uh, basically the more dimensional um, uh, issue. Of course, it's um, the idea to bring the money back, but in the field of asset recovery, you, you also have um, a lot of issues going beyond, let's say, a sole partner um, country context. First of all, it's um, basic, let's say, perhaps this goes into where it gets perhaps a bit political questions like conditionality of retrieving assets, but also um, very technical questions um, when um, asking for mutual legal assistance. Um, how do countries speak to each other? And um, this is again coming from Germany, where, for instance, the um, MLA request would. Um, that's not a development issue. Huh? They would go to um, the, the Ministry of Justice and would have to be processed there in a way. So also to address the issue um, in Germany, in Europe, that, um, uh, that um, MLA requests come and that they may not be filled out sufficiently but should not just be rejected. Huh? So what can you do technically, but also what can you do beyond technical solutions, network setting up that the people speak to each other, uh, that also our Colleagues in Germany, let's say not from development, understand um, uh, um, un understand the issue. And this brings me to my last point, which I want to highlight in this approach. It's basically twofold in the sense that w we support, um, let's say, the implementation of international standards. So along this follow the money chain. So you could say this is a bit like if you, if you look at it top down, we support... Um, FATF compliance, we support UNCA compliance, but on the other hand, we try to um, uh, s s bring, it, um, uh, bring knowledge which we get from the ground into the international discussion. And, um, and so this enables an approach which um, allows us to operate on the national level, on the regional level, um, and um, the global level. Last but not least, this approach is um, complemented, let's say, by our standard um, uh, approaches um, of, um, in, in the area of good financial governance. So this could be classical fiscal reforms, uh, looking at debt issues, or um, let's say classical anti-corruption reforms supporting uh, um, anti-corruption authorities, for example. Thank you very much. Thank you, for Johannes. And um, thank you for introducing some of the technical approaches that we have to actually um, react to or, or fight a kleptocratic system. And also thank you for highlighting the regional level as well as the international level and targeting measures also in, in the countries in the global north. So I would like to hand over to Veronica. Veronica, Moldova is one of the countries that has received uh, support from German Development Corporation. So what do you feel is the biggest challenge in fighting um, kleptocratic structures in Moldova and how did you address these challenges? Uh, good morning, everyone. Very nice uh, to have the opportunity to address you all. Um, I think uh, it's important to maybe give a little bit of context about uh, Moldova um, as we talk about what the challenges are that we face uh, today. Um, I want to start with uh, the definition of kleptocracy that um, USAID gave at one of the panels that I attended yesterday, which is a government controlled by officials who use political power to appropriate the wealth of their nation. I think if we used that definition, it's fair to say that Moldova was absolutely a kleptocracy. Um, the great and incredible thing is that through the democratic process, the Moldovan citizens have elected a government that is, has set as its primary agenda uh, the fight against corruption. And so on, on the grassroots level, of course, helped with by civil society, by journalists who really helped that movement, the Moldovan people have selected for themselves a new course. Um, the parliamentary elections that uh, brought that change into uh, effect uh, took place in July of 2021. So we are about 17 months into the reform of uh, Moldova. As we've heard at this conference, the window of opportunity for these types of reforms is actually quite small. Uh, I think the number I heard is from 18 to 24 months. Um, and so for Moldova, the new parliament that came in um, with the, the leadership of our president, who I think most of us uh, probably had the opportunity to hear speak on the first day of this conference. Um, I think you can get the sense that there's political will at a very high level in Moldova at this moment. Um, and so when we talk about what are the challenges that we face and what are some of the positive things that have worked uh, for our system, um, for me as a prosecutor, I think I can tell you the perspective that when we have a country that has been captured by kleptocrats, uh, oftentimes that means they captured the justice system because the only way they can actually achieve that widespread control and uh, theft of citizens' property is through the justice system. 
And so when we talk about reforms that have to come in and address the situation, uh, I think the justice system is the one that you have to start with, that you have to think about. Uh, because if we have corrupt prosecutors and judges, uh, you're never going to be able to go after those kleptocrats and all of their cronies and enablers that got the country to where it was. And that's a real challenge because you can't just fire all prosecutors and all judges and start over. We don't have new prosecutors and judges to pick from. But I think there are strategies that Moldova has uh, been working on and already implemented. Um, one of the recommendations from the USAID uh, klepto, uh, decleptification guide, that's a tough word to say, the decleptification guide is um, in these windows of opportunities, what uh, countries should do is pursue justice on grand corruption via specialized anti-corruption bodies headed by leaders whose integrity has been vetted by reputable foreign experts. And it's important here to, to note the foreign expert component and the fact that development partners can help in, uh, come in and help out on that effort. So in Moldova, what that has meant is, uh, first of all, uh, the uh, selection process for the chief of the anti-corruption prosecution office, the position that I hold, uh, was done in a brand new way. It involved having a pre-selection committee composed of uh, two Moldovan citizens, but three foreign uh, uh, experts that interviewed the candidates, evaluated them, and then gave their recommendation. Um, I don't think I would be in this position uh, today if it hadn't gone through a process like that. Uh, the other thing Moldova has already started implementing is a pre-vetting of the governing bodies that are responsible for oversight over the ju judiciary and the prosecution. And so that process is underway. And of course, that process is being undertaken with the help of uh, development partners because it's not uh, it's an expensive uh, process to undertake such an effort um, and those are uh, the types of things that we would address uh, corruption itself within the justice system which is so important uh, but at the same time I think our citizens want that type of result from prosecutors from judges they want to see the people responsible behind bars they want to see the millions and millions of dollars that have been stolen back in the state budget but if we think again about that window of opportunity, the 18 to 24 months, we have to be very realistic that you cannot have a final conviction. You cannot have a confiscation of hundreds of millions of dollars in 24 months. And so I think it's very important for us to be able to uh, talk about how to define progress in the reform of the justice system. How can we point to other factors that may not be a person behind bars or money in the state budget, but that still indicate that progress is being made? For me on the ground, I've only been in this uh, position for four months, but I have the sense that we have more and more citizens who have the courage to come report people that are soliciting bribes instead of paying those bribes. I think that's a reflection of what got us to this point. I think people became fed up with the status quo, with how things were done. Uh, they were uh, sick of the amount of money that they were, were being asked to pay for really re uh, things that they have a right to as citizens uh, to do. I think the people that had been stealing money and soliciting those bribes got too greedy and started asking for sums that were too high so people have had enough. And for me, the fact that we have courageous people in our societies that are reporting these crimes and are giving us prosecutors a chance to catch these people in the act, to charge them, to remove them out of prosecution offices, out of the justice system, that's the way we're going to make significant and lasting change. And I think we should be creative about the way we try to measure and capture that type of progress so that we can demonstrate to our citizens that they did make the right democratic choice when they chose justice and the rule of law uh, and peace and democracy over autocracies and kleptocracies. And so it's with our partners, we need coalitions with civil society, with journalists, with our development partners to all contribute to that effort uh, to, to be able to, to really make significant cha uh, uh, change. So I look forward to some of the discussions that we can continue to have to learn more from, from all of you and the different countries that have gone through these processes or maybe are in the middle of them or maybe they're trying to change the tide and get to that window of opportunity. I think we should all try to learn uh, from those experiences, from our mistakes and our successes and uh, make those types of changes uh, worldwide. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. Yeah, thank you for highlighting the importance of the judicial system when we try to tackle kleptocratic systems. And, but also thank you for reminding us how important political will is and that kind of generating a movement 
um, also you know, with uh, the civil society and with the citizens, like the individual citizens. But also pointing out some of the areas where we could have uh, be a bit better, where we need improvement, which is you know, being realistic, um, trying to manage expectations, trying to find alternative ways of communicating successes that is yeah, not yet people behind bars. Thank you very much. So, Susanna, I would like to turn to you. Um, which tools of the Open Government Partnership have proven useful to fight kleptocracies? <laughs> That's fine. Johannes was saving energy, which is so proper in these times. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I am a former journalist, um, and as a civil society member, I've been part of the, the global movement, Open Government Partnership. So I, I would say um, I could start with a very notorious list and bore you with information that you already know. Uh, open Government Partnership... Uh, serves 80 countries uh, or uh, has more than 80 member states and, uh, and additional tens of local governments who joined the movements and who pledged to make uh, a, a tangible change on the ground opening, opening up governments. Um, and at this conference you already heard uh, and OGP proves this uh, that uh, the reforms that open government brings are uh, are the ones that we already know. It's the transparency of information that you provide to media and to citizens uh, that levels the playing field and that really provides uh, societies with uh, access to, the, to exact information that, that they can really serve as equal partners to the state and, and, and to the countries and uh, that the societies uh, and its members can really serve as uh, as also a check check and balance or part of the part of the solution uh, and OGP confirms that uh, this list is not too long it's really uh, consisting of opening up uh, crucial information about how states are governed uh, in a proper manner uh, without barriers and fees uh, in a way that uh, that professionals, but also media and so civil society can use this information uh, uh, to, uh, to, to, to really show tangible results. Uh, but what, what I think uh, is more important to notice or to mention here is that kleptocratic systems are deeply entrenched systems. Uh, and uh, the, the problem, uh, as Veronica already pointed out, is not only to, uh, to secure the political will, and the window of opportunity, but to sustain the change one, once it happens. And it's not only about the expectations, uh, but also about delivering of the results. Um, and um, keeping, the trust of, uh, keeping the trust of the population, uh, and also showing the capacity and the professionality to really govern, which so many political uh, leaders fail, fail in. But also another aspect that I found very important, coming from a country from Central Europe, uh, which uh, lived through communism, through uh, uh, a very undemocratic regime. I myself remember it as a child. Uh, the profound change in my country happened when I was 14. And after the initial burst of freedom, uh, we experienced uh, autocracy. Uh, we experienced uh, systemic corruption and state capture, which resulted, uh, you may not remember it, but uh, five years ago it resulted to a killing of investigative journalist and, uh, and uh, his fiancée, which was a really shock to a country which was part of NATO and European Union at the time, which had many checks and balances in place, free elections uh, and, and, and proper institutions. Uh, and, and that came uh, that came as a sh as a shock, um, and in this country, uh, I could see that firsthand that what the kleptocratic systems really rely on is impunity and safe havens, the ways that they can siphon of 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 money abroad, and the devil of the reforms and of sustaining the trust and change is usually in details as much as in the technical assistance and solutions and capacity to govern. 
is in details and it's in informal structures. So I will mention only out of all these reforms as beneficial ownership, transparency, open contracting and public procurement, providing data to citizens, only one reform that is very close to my heart and that has been as, as a result of a uh, push for, from civil society and media, a very long-term push against the kleptocratic uh, state-captured uh, system. And that's, uh, that was a reform that deeply disrupted uh, the, the power networks in Slovakia, was a uh, setup of a register uh, that was uh, that was providing information on beneficial owners of companies with the focus on companies who was who were doing any type of business with the state so what the state realized is that it will be very very hard to have proper system verifying beneficial ownership across the board uh, so so it really focused on the most crucial and critical area and that was doing business with the with the state and uh, where this was really disrupting and fundamental was not only opening up the data, but realizing that you have to do many streams of that reform at once to really give it teeth. So the minister who was responsible at the time for setting up the register, she, only, she not only decided that this information should be available, but she was looking for an institution that really had teeth to implement such a reform and to verify the information. And you might imagine that this is really hard because no state, uh, and we heard this many times, not only during this conference, has capacity to verify all the information. So the brilliant idea here was to tap into the wealth of knowledge uh, that, that was kept by media and civil society and make them allies and of course make them allies in a secure way, in a way uh, that would be not dis disputed or that would be uh, not, uh, not constructive. So she vested the power to verify this information to the court, which has a, a very strong position, um, but also with the realization that, that the court can be flooded with tons and tons of cases. So a company, uh, every company that needs to enter data into this register can't do it by themselves, but they have to use a professional, either a notary or a banker or a lawyer with a license and with a personal responsibility for the accuracy of the data. So if the process shows that this data is not accurate, the professional who is putting in the data will be, will be sanctioned as well. Uh, the second, uh, the second feature of the reform, which was crucial for its success, uh, was a reversed burden of proof. The minister realized that, uh, you know, dealing with the global financial system of secrecy and of uh, uh, corporate uh, untransparency, uh, they will never be able to request information from Panama, Belize, or another safe havens. So if anyone claims that the, uh, the information that the company enters into the register is not accurate, uh, the company has to prove, uh, uh, the, the company has to prove the accuracy of the data, not the court. So it's the reversed burden, burden of proof, which is, a, which is quite a disputed approach, but uh, we have many precedences uh, from other cr crucial legal areas to, uh, to use, uh, use this measure. And the last one was opening up the claim procedure to media and journalists. So anyone can petition the court and anyone using the register and checking the data um, can challenge a company and say that the information they provided is, is not accurate. So only one third of cases that go through this court in Slovakia are started by the court itself. The, another two thirds come from civil society and media that have been doing investigations for a long, long time. And it needs to be a, a substantial claim. So they have to back it up with data. But then on the other side, they, they have a judge who is experienced. Uh, he's a former bank lawyer, so he knows the nitty gritties of the avoidance 
uh, of uh, workings, inner workings of these structures. So together, uh, they make a very strong, uh, very strong movement and a, and a very strong, uh, very strong force. And if uh, the court proves, or if the if the court uh, if the court decides that the information provided by the company is not uh, is not uh, correct, then the company is uh, is being deleted from the register, which means that they cannot. Uh, bet in a, in a, uh, open contracting bids uh, uh, for the with the state for five years so the sanction is draconic and what it led to uh, what it led to is that many oligarchs who've been hiding for years and years in Slovakia had to come out but re this reform also shows that you know we can approach uh, this, this disruption of kleptocratic systems formally, and we re really have to be thorough in the, in the way how we implement them, and we have to think of uh, where the risk lies, uh, lie, but also how we can involve, uh, in, involve allies uh, in, in this work. And I will be more than happy to share information with you why not only prosecution and the judicial system are crucial, but, but why other reforms, uh, increasing transparency, can really uh, make a difference uh, on the ground. And the very last point that I would like to mention is that too much is being said about uh, developing democracies or democracies uh, uh, who are facing a window of opportunity for this change or dealing with their kleptocratic systems. And it has been pointed out, I just at this conference, I just want to echo it, uh, and Johannes said it himself, uh, that we talk too little about uh, the international global financial system responsible for setting up a framework that is allowing the siphoning of money from the kleptocratic systems to uh, save havens in developed democracies, in strong economies. Uh, we are not talking enough about the responsibility of the global north. And uh, I must say, as an, as an activist, as a long-term anti-corruption activist coming from uh, a very problematic part of the world, I must say that there is this paradox that these countries have been under such a monitoring and surveillance of developed democracies for a long time that they have set up incredible systems like this one that I have just mentioned. Uh, and the transparency framework in these countries is usually much further ahead than in the traditional democracies. And this has been our case. Uh, I was leading a watchdog organization as a former journalist for 15 years. We were part of many investigations into corruption. And what we could see that the system of requesting information in Slovakia and uh, finding data, being able to combine data uh, and work with them was much more developed in Slovakia than uh, in, uh, in other countries like Switzerland, Holland, Germany, uh, the US. Uh, when, uh, when we investigated a huge uh, corruption scandal in Slovakia worth of 40 million euro, so it was not a, a small deal, we waited for the US prosecution to, uh, to give us information for a year and a half, and then we got no answer. Um, and we faced a, a very similar, uh, similar experience with other countries. So I think that we need to really look into the developed democracies and, and see how they could strengthen their own systems, their own transparency of, of, of data, of beneficial ownership uh, information, etc. Thank you, Susanna. Um, thank you for, for highlighting the different layers of reform that we actually have to, to think of when we try to support reform processes, making sure that they are comprehensive, um, yeah, covering different uh, topics in different risk areas. Um, and also thank you for reminding us that we have to uh, sustain the change um, also beyond the 18 or 24 months, as you have also <coughs> mentioned, Veronica. So I would like to turn to, to Patrick. Um, I'm sure that uh, what Susanna has says, said about uh, the role of the Global North also resonates with you and the work that uh, Global Witness has done. So um, would you like to, to add from your experience with Global Witness on how you tackle that topic? 
Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I was, I was going to pick up on some of the points that Susanna made, actually, because I think one of the first things we need to do is increase the understanding that corruption is a globalized industry. You know, when I talk to my friends and people who've known me for years and listen to me witter on in pubs about what I do, um, they still say, well, it's terribly corrupt in that country over there, isn't it? That nasty hot tropical place, whatever. Um, and, and I say, it's globalized. You know, what happens there, as we all know in this room, of course, is that if bribes are paid to get some concession, some contract, that money goes out of the country and it's very often going in Western banks, ending up in Western real estate, etc. It's globalized. And so I, I sort of, I draw a distinction. I think maybe it'd be valuable for the message to draw a, a distinction from what you said. It's actually not, we must remember the role particularly of, of the global north, is we are part of the kleptocratic system. It's not, you know, it's, we're, it's not separate. It, it's, it's one thing. Um, and, you know, it's, it's interesting right now, there's a very delicious scandal breaking in the UK um, where Lady Moan, a member of the House of Lords, um, when COVID was um, getting going, um, started lobbying. We had a, a, this is part, I, I genuinely believe that, you know, the UK is going down this route, this route of kleptocracy, it's getting more corrupt. And so there was a VIP lane to submit um, tenders for PPE equipment. Um, why should there be a VIP lane? And that enabled politically connected people to suggest people they knew who might be good for, for providing masks or has, hazmat coats or whatever. Um, and she, the scandal is that she was very aggressively lobbying ministers on behalf of a company, but she was making the point that the company's nothing to do with her, it's just the people she knew in Hong Kong who could deliver good stuff. Um, and within, uh, and the company she was talking about actually hadn't been incorporated at the time she was doing this. They got 200 million pounds worth of contracts. They incorporated their company. The equipment came in. There's a kind of side issue about 120 million pounds worth of that has been frozen because the stuff was substandard. And what's breaking now is that, in fact, the company was um, connected to her husband's business empire. And they siphoned off something like, I can't remember the number now, like 80 million. Um, and, and, you know, we got, this is, the, the top, this is the heart of the British government. Um, it's, it's just crazy. Um, so, yeah, we, we're sort of very much part of that system. Just to sort of move on a bit, yeah, I mean, as a, an NGO, an investigative NGO, the thing that sort of really excites me, apart from uncovering the corruption, is the role of the enablers. And, the, you know, there's a top London law firm, Mishkon Dorea, and one lawyer, James Libson, in that firm, represented four people that we investigated in completely different investigations in different parts of the world. But he was the guy who represented them. How do they all go to him? Where does he advertise, you know? Um, and, and these guys are operating right, you know, they'll say, we're, of course, we're, we're just applying the law, but they're, they're just sort of a bit like his dark materials. They keep going to the other side a little bit. Um, and of course, the banks, the accountancy firms, the, the company registration agents, all of this network, um, which, you know, they, they still exist. So in terms of what's missing, you know, it's, we all know about these things. They're still there. They're still doing it. As an NGO, um, the legal aspect is really important. I mean, you talked about the ultimate horror of, you know, journalists being murdered. But, you know, before that, you know, the slap suits come in, the, the you know, the, the legal cases we faced, you know, oh, we're going to sue you for 200 million or whatever, you know, it, We've never lost one, but you spend an awful lot of money defending yourself against them, which is going to be better spent on other things. Um, and, you know, uh, and the issue of impunity, I think, is a critical one in various ways. And I'll give you another specific example. We exposed a few years ago, um, 2016, the fact that a uh, £150 million worth of London property, a, a big block of Baker Street, where Sherlock Holmes lived, um, had he lived, um, <laughs> Uh, ironically, and some mansions in Highgate were owned by, um, well, they were owned by a set of anonymously owned companies that we pinned down to being connected to the ruling family of Kazakhstan. Um, and we, we couldn't get to the exact person. And, and the, the head of that family, who, who was the son-in-law of the president of Kazakhstan um, and the head of the country's secret police, um, he ended up getting falling out of favor, divorcing the daughter and, and hanging himself in an Austrian prison. But that, that's an aside. So 
the information was out there. And there are two things that came from this, which I think are relevant. David Cameron, the prime minister, was touring uh, Asia, sort of promoting British business. And he, in a speech, said, you know, he referenced this case and said, we will have um, a public registry of foreign-owned property in London. We're going to have it next year. Um, then Brexit happened. Cameron resigned. Um, and nothing happened. No public registry, no public registry, until Russia invaded Ukraine. So it took a war to shock the British government into actually doing something about that. And the National Crime Agency took out unexplained wealth orders against members of this family. Um, and Mishkon Dereyer, against again, leapt in. And, uh, and the National Crime Agency lost, so the properties were not seized. And, and the judge, La Lady Justice Lang, said, and uh, this is indelibly stamped on my mind, said, notwithstanding his criminality, Rakat Aliyev was a successful businessman. Um, and I think, and, and I've noticed across lots of our, our cases that it, it seems that the ruling families of corrupt classic elites are very often extremely successful entrepreneurs in their own right. Um, and, and my colleague Tom Main, who, who um, had exposed that case, said it's like saying, well, yeah, it's like notwithstanding um, his criminality, Harvey Weinstein was a successful ladies' man, you know. Um, uh, it's, it's, that, that's in our courts, you know. So it's just really crazy. Um, and going on on impunity, you know, Glencore were recently fined in the UK one and a half billion pounds. Glencore didn't commit any corruption. Somebody in Glencore did. Somebody. But that person wasn't fined. That person wasn't in jail. That's a key part of this. When you start getting top executives who make corrupt decisions, who manage those schemes, when they go to jail, then you can, I think, steal a, 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 a radical change in how things happen. But one and a half billion pounds to Glencore? Cost of doing business. Um, financiers. 60% um, of Amazonian deforestation uh, is related to cattle ranching. Uh, we did produce a report a while back showing that six banks, uh, six major banks had funded those operations to the tune of 44 billion pounds. Um, Without that financing, those things couldn't happen, and most of those things are related to corruption. So I think we need to put much more onus on those kind of things. I'm coming to a close short, shortly. Um, yeah, and, and something I, I, I said in the plenary yesterday, I think we had to get corporate money out of politics. Um, and until we do, we're never going to get rid of this, because our politicians cannot ignore you know, if, if they're, the job they're going to get when they get kicked out of office. Um, or, you know, the fact their party is dependent on somebody's money, they're not going to upset those people. It's, it's a perversion of our system, and I think that has to change. Um, I could go on for hours. I'll stop there, though. Thanks. <laughs> thank you, Patrick. Um, yeah, thank you for, for highlighting that uh, it's not only about the contribution that the Global North um, has in those uh, kleptocratic systems, but that they're being part and parcel of the kleptocratic system. Um, and, and how, yeah, we can, we can actually go about that. So we are actually um, already running a bit late in time, and I really want to do the working groups because I see that we have a good crowd here and it would be nice to engage with them more actively. But Karam, I would also like to turn to you because you have also a very uh, specific and interesting example um, in, in South Africa that we can learn from, uh, that we can actually learn from how to prevent, you know, that kleptocratic system to really establish or to really get that strong, kind of try to look more into future-proofing our democracies. Right. Thank you. Thanks so much, Anna. It's fascinating to listen to these uh, discussions and to think about the idea of corruption being a globalized industry, because I think that concept in some ways is in tension with this notion of kleptocracies and good and bad actors in kind of discrete jurisdictions. Uh, it thinks about something that's more kind of systemic and linked and networked. So, you know, the story of South Africa in this recent period um, has been about thinking about these concepts. Um, we've had lots of debates over the years about notions of uh, petty corruption, grand corruption, endemic corruption, and now this term kind of kleptocracy. But what really um, has, has taken hold as a concept in South Africa is the notion of state capture. And um, what's, what, what we've gone through in this recent period now has been a, a four-year 
Judicial Commission of Inquiry into allegations of state capture. The, that was launched in 2018, and the, uh, it was envisioned that it would that the commission would take six months, maybe at maximum. It was never envisioned that the commission would go on for for four years. And the uh, if you look at the terms of reference of the commission, they were extremely broad. And the the, the chairperson of the commission said that if we were to investigate. Uh, every provincial department in South Africa, every municipality uh, with regard to allegations of state capture that the commission would have taken 10 years to complete its work. Um, so, you know, it's clear that uh, this commission had to make very difficult choices uh, about what it looked at and what it, and what it didn't look at. Um, it, it gripped the nation. Uh, it kind of categorized a period from about 2010 up until about 2017 as a, as an era of state capture. Uh, this was under the rule of President Jacob Zuma. But I think it's important to note, and I've said this publicly in conferences and been rebuked by some, that state capture didn't start with Jacob Zuma and it, didn't, it hasn't ended with, with Jacob Zuma. So if you look at um, the South Africa's journey into becoming a constitutional democracy, even in the era of Nelson Mandela, we had a kind of situation of grand corruption with a very notorious uh, scandal relating to the st strategic arms procurement. Even while this commission of inquiry was taking place, we've had massive scandals still about in relationship to PPE uh, and in other uh, uh, provincial departments of health. So, you know, it remains really a, an incredible, incredibly hot button issue in South Africa. So what, what did the commission look at? Um, and I just want to just want to just spend a moment um, in terms of what the commission focused on. It focused on the issue of irregular appointments, the improper conduct of national officials, uh, concerted efforts and activities by a private family, the Gupta family, into the control and governance of state-owned enterprises, and particularly the uh, um, the capture of procurement systems. Uh, the issue of um, capture of key oversight institutions, so the weakening of the National Prosecuting Authority, of the police, of the South African Revenue Service, the role of the ruling governing party, the African National Con Congress, and then the role of key enablers. Um, the, the commission was as a result of um, whistleblower, uh, uh, whistleblower action, uh, an aggressive civil society and courageous uh, uh, public officials. So the, the argument can be made that, that somehow the rule of law held in South Africa and was able to sort of counteract this uh, moment of kleptocracy, this kind of decade uh, of state capture. You know, if I were to go to a South African audience and say that South Africa has a strong rule of law system, uh, uh, I would get a lot of pushback. Uh, uh, South Africa remains an incredibly uh, violent society. It's an incredibly unequal society. But somehow, in this moment, and through uh, uh, this nexus of whistleblowers, of civil society, and of, uh, and of uh, some resilient institutions that weren't captured with, within the state, we were able to get this commission, which has been a, a great victory for transparency. Uh, we're talking about uh, a six-part six, uh, report. The, they, they released the report at different stages in the course of 2022, um, which gives a, a full kind of diagnostic. Well, not full, because it didn't go, go into every municipality and it didn't go into every provincial department, but quite a, quite a, 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 a full picture of how state capture functioned. Now the challenge of this uh, and the challenge of a judicial commission of inquiry is that the findings and recommendations of the commission were not binding and that uh, it wasn't a mechanism for justice. So at the end of the commission, we have a handoff now to the prosecuting authority, to the police, uh, to pursue uh, consequence management, whether that be through uh, prosecutions, 
I'll, I'll say asset recovery, but most of the assets have been laundered uh, and have left the country. It's going to be very difficult to trace them. And to a certain extent, uh, a blacklisting uh, of key uh, enabling entities. So it's, it's worth noting that McKinsey have been indicted in South Africa as a result of uh, their uh, complicit, uh, alleged complicity in the capture of Transnet and Bain Consulting have now been blacklisted in South Africa following their blacklisting by the, 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 the UK Parliamentary Office for their role in the capture of the South African Revenue Service. Following the, the final release of the report, the president was given uh, three months uh, to, to provide a comprehensive response. He's now done that in, somewhat, in a somewhat um, legalistic way. Um, you know, so for instance, for the, the slew of recommendations relating to reform of oversight bodies and parliament, the president said, I'm not going to comment on these. We have separation of powers. Uh, that can go to parliament. Uh, when it came to recommendations about the prosecution of individuals, the president said, well, you know, that goes to law enforcement. I'm not going to comment on that. When it came to issues of enhanced whistleblower protection and support, Department of Justice uh, is looking at that. Uh, when it came to issues of procurement reform, well, that's sitting with National Treasury now, and we've got a new bill that's looking at uh, public procurement reform in South Africa. So a very kind of formalistic response, but, but, but a response nevertheless, and, and Parliament has done that as well. So, so where are we now? We're, we're at a moment where uh, this president that we sit with who has some bona fides in terms of supporting this commission, in terms of attempting to revitalize certain key institutions like the Revenue Service and the Prosecuting Authority, now has a cloud over his head in terms of a corruption scandal involving uh, his own private business interests. Uh, he breeds uh, exotic game and cattle. Uh, and the story is that uh, he sold a, uh, a bull, a, a, a buffalo, to a Sudanese businessman. He received 500,000 plus US dollars in cash uh, for the sale of this uh, bull. Um, he did not bank that money. Uh, he did not put the money in the safe uh, on his farm. He, the money was hidden in uh, the couch, in various pieces of furniture in his house. But then the kicker was the money was stolen. Uh, and, and the allegation is that he, uh, he covered this up uh, and that it was a, you know, so, so he's now facing these uh, serious allegations and this could lead to uh, an inquiry at parliament and a potential impeachment proceeding. But he's sort of kicked this into touch. He's taken an, uh, a provisional report on judicial review and then this will now carry over into the new year. So, you know, in terms of sort of how we think about future-proofing the democracy, uh, to avoid state capture going forward. We have a, a set of comprehensive recommendations from the commission. We have the response from the president. We have a, a national anti-corruption strategy and some of these recommendations map on top of that strategy. So, you know, we're in this kind of, uh, what we've spoken about is this window of opportunity, uh, a window which could, could close very quickly if um, this president were to be removed and uh, other leaders from his party who may be even less committed, who may, e even, who may be even more implicated in their own corruption scandals, uh, uh, taking the leadership mantle and kind of further diluting uh, a kind of purposeful program to kind of re reform South Africa. So it's a really interesting case study. Uh, I'm not sure that um, the term state capture as it's come into South African discourse maps uh, neatly uh, into a kind of earlier era of state capture as we've understood it in, in the kind of post-Soviet context. But I think these are issues uh, at an academic level that are interested, that we're interested in, in, in engaging with. But I think on a more practical level, I think we're, you know, we're really looking at issues around uh, how we can strengthen oversight bodies, how we can ensure that the civil spaces that we have remain open, how we can continue to enhance whistleblower protection and support, and, and you know, really kind of leverage the, the, 
the medium rule of law kind of circumstance that we have in South Africa and, and deepen and enhance that. So let me leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karam. And uh, thank you to um, drawing our attention to the fact that we actually don't necessarily have to wait for windows of opportunities when the kleptocratic system is already in place, but that there might also be windows of opportunities earlier when um, yeah, law enforcement or judicial institutions and uh, the support uh, of civil society come together so that actually a further strengthening of the structures can be prevented. So now I have announced it for those of you who came in late. So I see that you're already raising your hand. We're, we're wanting to have a bit of a different approach. We would like to go into working groups so that we can make sure we get as um, intense feedback from the audience as possible. And um, although we are already behind time, I would uh, really like to continue with that idea and approach. So I will ask all of you to um, gather in working groups on uh, specific topics. Uh, we thought we could have um, five working groups in total. Um, I would, we would have uh, one working group that would actually be with my colleague Carola over here that will um, discuss the question around kind of the biggest success factors or stumbling blocks uh, for measures targeted at fighting kleptocracies. And that working group is going to tap on the expertise of Patrick Alley. So there's one working group over here. Carol, maybe you can raise your hand again so everybody knows where to go for that working group. Then we will have one working group with Johannes, who is going to move to that corner of the room, um, who is going to discuss with you potential entry points for um, programs um, targeted at fighting kleptocracies. Um, then we will have one working group with Veronica. Maybe you can move to the back corner there. Um, and that working group is uh, looking into the topic of impunity and how um, the um, experience in Moldova could or could not be transferred also to other countries. Um, we will have Karam, maybe you can move to that <coughs> corner of the, of the room um, that will focus on a topic of prevention as we've just heard um, him talk about it as well. And then we will have Susanna, and Susanna, you will have the shortest way, maybe just staying here in the middle, um, um, and you will look into innovative approaches kind of beyond what we've been already hearing at this conference um, in the past days. So. Um, just to make this a bit more of a quicker um, exercise, it would be great if you could stay with the people that are kind of closest to you in the room, but if you feel the need to really um, stay, go to one of the persons or to other working group, then of course that's also fine, you can move around a little bit. I'll give you two minutes to find your working groups, and then we'll have five minutes to uh, ten minutes to discuss in the working groups before we come back to the plenary. Um, to our online participants, I'm very sorry that you cannot participate in the working groups, but we will be back in 10 minutes with a plenary, and we will then also take the questions in the chat. So, enjoy the working groups.
We have another two minutes only, unfortunately. Two minutes for the working groups. So unfortunately, I will have to ask you to slowly but surely wrap up. Get back to the plenary. Just very last, very quick points, please. <laughs> So working group coordinators, please come back to the plenary. So we have chance to share the insights of the group work. I will start pulling at people if you don't start coming back by yourself. <laughs> Johannes? Johannes, time to come back. Susanna? Yeah. Sorry. Thank you.
So everybody, I'm going to start with a panel. You can continue that discussion later, but now we would like to hear the insights from your working groups. To our panelists, please come back to the panel. Please. We'll just do a brief wrap up and then you can continue the discussion. I'm trying hard. <laughs> Panelists, please come back to the panel. Okay, as we are running out of time, unfortunately, we will make this just a rather quick round of feedback from the different working groups. I will ask all of the panelists to maybe share with us the one or the most two key takeaways from all of the working groups so we can try to wrap up this session still in time. Um, Johannes as you're sitting right next to me, would you be willing to start on the entry points? Okay. One or two key takeaways. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Anna, and thanks, group. I think we had a really, um, we had a really lively uh, discussion going on. Um, first takeaway, it's really difficult. Uh, and um, uh, also, um, uh, so there's, um, uh, there, there, there are no quick solutions, but we, we, we discussed a few, I think, very relevant um, uh, um, aspects. Um, one one interesting point was you cannot plan for it, so it's really difficult to 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 think you can plan everything through and then um, the entry point will come and you go you go inside. Um, another um, aspect we touched upon, which was quite interesting, was this aspect of um, let's say if there is a chance, um, a, a window of opportunity, an entry point, change of government, you go in, um, this aspect of working with the champions. And um, uh, we, um, we discussed um, this, that um, of, of course you tend to work with champions and it is important, but there is, um, um, we perhaps sometimes do it too, or you, we should do it more critically, or keep in mind um, that these champions may, um, uh, should stay champions, uh, let's say, uh, put it like that, and um, discuss how, how can we ensure that the champions stay champions. We discussed it with the um, uh, ex Afghanistan example where champions failed to be champions. Um, we discussed it from the aspect, are there incentives you can, um, uh, you ca can you incentivize this in a way? Um, should we focus perhaps less on the political leaders? Um, which alternatives would there be? Um, discussing perhaps moving to a more decentralized approach or also keeping a decentralized, a local approach um, also, um, also in mind. Um, last point perhaps, um, we should be modest. Huh? Modest what we can do, especially what we can do from outside. Um, be there, watch the process and um, come in when, um, when needed and, um, uh, and, and when there is a chance and an opportunity. Thank you, Johannes. Susanna, would you be willing to share your insights? One or two key takeaways. <laughs> but that's good that you make it systemically. <laughs> One can see that it's I'm efficient. Yes. Parents, <laughs> Thank you very much, Johannes. Uh, we had a wonderful uh, working group with uh, experience from all uh, areas of the globe. I, th I start backwards. Uh, we had a wonderful point uh, made by a gentleman from Uganda from a, from a state institution, and it explains uh, by your colleague from this uh, a little bit further that uh, what is important in kleptocracies is that you have at least some type of institutions who are more integral and uh, that, that they disrupt, disrupt the existing power networks. So institutions who really mean it, um, and who offer uh, the civil society real partnerships. So when it comes from the state institution, it has a much 
a higher legitimacy. Um, and it also, the partnership with civil society, as I, uh, as I understood, is when it's, uh, when it's meaningful, it builds back the capacity of the state institution and really, really helps with, uh, with their efforts and, and with work. So what is important to have these genuine partnerships. Um, then we had a, a, a wonderful uh, remark from Colombia, from uh, from a lady who worked in a, uh, compliance, that uh, in these kleptocratic systems and in institutions you already have allies. You have people who know the information, but they don't make decisions, business decisions, political decisions. So it's crucial to think of innovations that can empower these people in the system uh, that have the proper information and how through regulation or through cooperation and networks uh, we could make it possible to give them voice. Uh, they usually we give them voice as uh, through whistleblower protection or whistleblower frameworks, but uh, if we could think of innovative ways how to systemically uh, uh, support these type of people within the system, especially working in the compliance, uh, it would be wonderful. And uh, we had a case from Moldova, from Veronica's uh, home country, where of course uh, uh, people working on disrupting kleptocrats uh, uh, lack human resources, and uh, and the gentleman from Moldova pointed out that in for investigation it is really crucial to digitalize, uh, to get proper training to people, and to uh, to use innovative softwares and technologies that are available, uh, but but are not that are widely available, but not available in these countries that really need them. In a, t in a timely matter, manner and very quickly how you could uh, distribute the, the peer knowledge uh, to those who really need it and, uh, and that through technology and training and surveillance uh, uh, softwares uh, you can really empower people on the ground. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. Patrick, would you be willing to share the one or two key messages from your working group? Yeah, I will. Um, thank you. It was a really nice chat. Um, so very quickly going through it, I think I've summarized the main protagonists usually get away with it. Um, and whether that's um, legally or simply they've managed to amass an enormous amount of money and, and one person very humorously talked about the comparison of the Marxist origination of capital, the same as the origination of sin. Um, uh, asset recovery, major issue, needs to happen. Um, suggestions of a like an 80 percent kind of tax on the super rich to to damp their um temptations um and of course going to prison um the i think there's a quite a lot of discussion about the role of donors and the eu in particular um mixed messages in the sense that they are all saying oh, we want to stop corruption but they're doing deals with the government to buy oil uh, whatever um Support for civil society, I think both financial and from a security perspective, because obviously in many countries, as we've heard from, from you and from various other people, uh, you know, prison and worse uh, is very often the result of protesting. Um, and also going for the enablers, you know, actually maybe just trying to do those people for things like professional misconduct, withdrawal solicitors, licenses, etc. Thank you so much. Karam, you're up next. Great. Um, well, first of all, let me just thank again uh, Anna and uh, Carola for insisting that we do a workshop because I could just just feel the energy just rise in the room and we had a lovely, lo lovely discussion. We spoke about preventative measures um, and I think the first strong message that came out was that tr transparency, transparency, transparency. You know, you can't begin to think about what, uh, uh, what the problem is and what the solutions are if you don't know what's going on. So there needs to be more transparency built into the system and this is particularly relevant in the South African context, I think or in many contexts around procurement reform uh, because that's where the big ticket uh, uh, theft took place. Uh, the point was raised around um, reform of political party financing and the, the dirty money in, 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 um, that goes into political parties. Um, somebody mentioned uh, that we need to also think about greater transparency in terms of the work of the IMF and the World Bank. Uh, that you know we don't we don't often uh, we you know there's just those processes are not transparent. We don't understand how uh, uh, how 
you know, transfers work and, and the conditionality involved in that. And then I think critical to understanding how state capture and kleptocracy functioned was about these, this notion of irregular appointments. So ensuring that there's much, that there's good governance reform, particularly around appointments in state-owned enterprises. And I think uh, broadly in, within the criminal justice sector, and I think that also aligns with Veronica's point earlier in terms of how she was appointed and how that was a, a, a rigorous uh, and you know, a, a strong process. So those were some of the key points, thanks. Thank you. Uh, and last, uh, we talked in our group about how to counter uh, impunity, um, and in particular thinking about those jurisdictions where uh, they are in a state of state capture, and so the people that are in power would not really have an interest in, in uh, uh, prosecuting or going after the people that are committing the crimes. Um, and uh, there were two uh, interesting ideas uh, that we discussed. Uh, the first being, um, there's some discussion right now happening uh, around the world about perhaps setting up an international anti-corruption Court, um, and whether maybe that type of uh, setup of uh, trying these types of cases uh, is a way to address, in particular, uh, big corruption cases from jurisdictions that do not have the national capacity to, or political will to be able to do it. Um, another was uh, an example that was given where, you know, if we have, we I think all sort of understand that the people that steal uh, in large, large sums from their own countries tend to then. Uh, use or benefit from the things that they've stolen abroad. Um, and so they have huge uh, villas and private jets in other jurisdictions. And those other jurisdictions can really step up and prosecute in their jurisdictions things for money laundering. Um, and there are good examples of places like the United States, uh, France, that have done those types of uh, prosecutions where we at least can seize the assets. So even if we can't go after putting the person behind bars, uh, we can at least uh, take assets and then return it back uh, to the countries that it was stolen from. But of course, we'd have to be careful about how it's returned back to the country. You wouldn't, be, you wouldn't give it to the same government that has stolen it, but working again with civil society um, and other um, actors to, to make sure that the citizens that are the victims of those crimes are the ones that can actually benefit from it. So those are some of the good uh, ideas we discussed with people from really all over the world. So it's uh, a privilege to get to have these types of uh, discussions with this conference. Thank you so much to all of you. Thank you to the panelists and also to the audience for actively contributing to our discussion. It will be my difficult task now to maybe highlight some of the key areas looking into the initial idea of wanting jointly to design a global program to fight kleptocratic systems. So um, I will try to summarize, uh, starting with the entry points. Where do we start when we want to support these reform processes? And uh, we've been hearing that, of course, we we need the political will, we need the support from civil society, um, but nevertheless, we don't have to wait for it. There is, um, we have to actually be ready already when these window of opportunities, when these enter, um, entry points actually arise. And that means we have to work with champions that we actually already identify before the actual you know, window of opportunity comes up. Um, and that uh, we have to partner with civil society, for example, that we have to also partner with um, uh, champions that might not be in the decision-making uh, um, positions as in yet. And we have to be able to adapt um, to whenever the, the opportunity arises then. So that would be the entry point for our program. Then what would be the, uh, some of the core processes, reform processes that we have to support? Um, we've it has been mentioned many times that any reform to increase transparency should definitely be included in our global program, um, but especially increasing transparency ar around public procurement processes and also political finance would be crucial for a global program to fight kleptocratic uh, structures. Um, and also the reforms of the justice sector should be um, a core um, element of our global program um, so that uh, yeah, we make sure that those who are actually the perpetrators will, will end up eventually behind bars, not saying that we're going to do that within the next three years of our program. Um, we should also include uh, the very important topic of whistleblowers and whistleblower protection into our global program, as they are the ones that um, are in the, have the um, capacity to actually start some of these very crucial reform processes. And we should make uh, use of um, the opportunities that come with digitization um, in all of these reform processes. Um, so those are some of the reform processes that we would look at. 
at the bilateral kind of country part, um, partner country level. But as we've mentioned, it is just as important to also tackle the regional and the international level, and here especially the enablers of those kleptocratic systems. And we heard that some maybe newer ideas would be to, to uh, look into establishing maybe an international anti-corruption court or international institutions with prosecution authority, um, and also to improve the prosecution of money laundering um, definitely in the countries in the global north. And last but not least, we have to make sure that our, in our program we also have an element that makes sure that we can communicate results, um, even the smaller step results that we can achieve within the project period of three years, and that um, we can therefore contribute to also sustaining the change, making sure that it will continue after our program has ended. So that, to me, was the outline of our global program, and I'm very happy to engage with all of you after this. Um, if you want to add elements to the global program. Um, but thank you very much uh, once again for, for joining us in this discussion, and I hope you have a good rest of the day. <laughs>